Good day, and welcome to What's Happening MoCo, a podcast that empowers residents, community organizations, and businesses with the answers to the question, what's happening, MoCo? Today we meet council member Kristen Mink. Born and raised in Montgomery County, Kristen is a first-generation Chinese-American, a proud Montgomery County Public Schools graduate, go Blazers, former MCPS teacher, and a community organizer who spent years fighting for social, racial, economic, and climate justice. Good day, Council Member Mink. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Hey, thank you so much for being here. And I might want to add that you are also a proud mom Mm -hmm. and you're a senior legislative organizer for the Center for Popular Democracy. Yeah, that well, not anymore, but uh, anymore. Okay. Just prior to taking on this role uh, with the county council. Wonderful, wonderful. So I think part of what we'll talk about today is your your journey to becoming a, a county council member. But before we talk about your journey to becoming a county council member, let's talk about how it's been so far. You have you were inaugurated in December along with a, a, sc- a new school, I want to say, of council mm-hmm. members. Mm-hmm. How has it been so far serving as a county council member for, I believe, District 5? That's right. Yeah, it's been great. It's been really, in- really interesting, really busy, uh, but it's been wonderful. Yeah, it was inaugurated. Uh, there's 11 of us. Six of us are, are women. All of the new folks are all women. So that's very exciting. The the voters spoke loud and clear there. Um, the most diverse a council that uh, Montgomery County has ever had, which is very exciting. Um, and it's been great. It's a, it's a lot of, um, for those of us for whom it's our first term, uh, a lot of meetings with so many different community organizations, nonprofits, um, uh, county departments and agencies, just all, you know, all of the different pieces uh, and groups that help to keep things running in our county that help to support the community. So learning about what everybody does, what, what, niches they filled, what their needs are, what support is needed, as well as, um, you know, getting to know there are many constituents who we represent now and, and working on the issues that are most important to them. So a lot going on all at one time, but it's been really interesting uh, and it's been great. All right. And and what issues have you found to be uh, the standout the most and when you met with the various groups? So uh, top of mind for me right now, um, and and what I heard a lot on the campaign trail um, was about the cost of housing uh, and about tenants' rights. Those were certainly overriding issues. And so that's something that we're working on intensively right now. We have a bill moving on that right now. Um, And I'm happy to tell you more about that. Schools also super important to me. I'm a former MCPS teacher, as as you mentioned. Um, I I taught for quite a long time. I'm the parent of MCPS students. I went through MCPS. Um, All that is to say our schools are super important, uh, not just to me, but to the community, of course. And I certainly heard that on the doors and I'm hearing that as well now. So making sure that we um, are investing heavily in our school system, that the investment, that there is accountability and transparency attached to that, that we're funding things that work and that are really gonna make a difference. Our kids are really struggling right now. Um, That we are maintaining our school buildings. A lot of them need a a significant amount of work and we need to make sure that we have the funding to be able to make those improvements. Um, And mental health is another issue that's very much top of mind um, for our school students. Uh, and their fa- and their families, as well as you know, all, all the way up through seniors, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic. You know, mental health was already an issue, and mm-hmm. and uh, the pandemic certainly exacerbated things. Certainly, certainly. Uh, so you you mentioned the the effects of how um, the the COVID impacted our schools, our students, our parents. Mm-hmm. How has it pa- impacted the county, and how is the county recovering um, from what you can see thus far? Yeah, I mean, there there are a lot of struggles that were really um, highlighted and made worse during the pandemic. Um, mental health was just one of them, but um, you know, housing security was a big one. We have seen well during the pandemic, we had instituted a temporary rent stabilization measure, and rent stabilization uh, it just limits the amount that landlords can increase rents from from year to year as people re-sign those contracts. How much is your rent gonna go up? So rent stabilization sets some kind of a limit. Um, And um, so that was in place 
temporarily during the pandemic. And uh, the hope was that that would continue to be ex expanded or, or extended. And then that the council would put a permanent measure in place to ensure that um, in my, you can live in Montgomery County as a renter and have some kind of predictability that there is some kind of check. Uh, and we're not just allowing ridiculous price gouging that is, uh, you know, unhousing our, our lower income folks. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, the previous council did not extend the temporary protections um, and, uh, and also did not put in place permanent protections. So now there are no protections. And so we are seeing skyrocketing rents as well as skyrocketing evictions. Um, and that is something that we need to get a hold of because every month more people's leases come up. They get hit, hit with these big increases uh, and folks are leaving the county. And, um, and it's, not a, it's not a small number of people either. I mean, our, our, the bill that we brought um, that we're working on, which is it's called the HOME Act, um, we worked with the, all the major labor unions in our area uh, because it is, it is working people as well um, who are working hard for the county and, and still are unable to afford, the, afford rent and afford the rent increases that they're getting. We worked with uh, community groups who have been uh, helping to serve some of our hardest hit, most vulnerable communities throughout the pandemic um, who are giving us great insights into what people are truly able to for afford and what we need to do to keep people housed. Um, so, uh, you know, housing is a big one and it really touches every area of our community from, you know, how our kids are able to do in school to uh, public safety, um, to how our businesses are able to, are able to thrive within our community. So it touches so many different things. Um, and it was, again, exacerbated during the pandemic. We had temporary measures to try to keep a cap on it. That cap has been removed. Uh, and now we're in pretty dire straits. Wow. Wow. It's, it seems that you've hit the ground running. Um, you're only three months, um, more or less, into um, your service to the county. Um, and, and, and you already have issues that you are taking um, you're, you're taking the lead on. So let's take a step back. Uh, one of the things we try to do in the podcast is allow people to get to know their council members and get to know the people that serve them. Um, what was your journey like to become a council member? And were there like certain um, points in your journey that were more significant other than others? And if so, could you share those as well? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm from Montgomery County. I'm born and raised here. My mom, as you mentioned, uh, she's a, a Chinese immigrant. Um, and um, this was certainly not the path that I saw for myself growing up. Um, I always thought I would be a teacher, actually, which I was for a long time. My mom also worked for MCPS. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I spent much of my growing up life imagining myself as a teacher. Uh, and I really did love, love teaching. Um, that said, even as I was teaching, I did a lot of you know, advocacy and, and activist work on the side. And, um, but it wasn't, you know, but I wasn't driving it, you know, I would, I'm sure a lot of people get those, those emails or those text blasts that say, you know, call your Congress member and tell them this or send this email or show up to this March or this protest or, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and I would do those, I would do those things. Um, and, um, there was a, a moment when I, uh, got a little more heavily involved on the organizing side of things. And that was spurred by uh, a viral video moment, actually. Strangely enough, uh, it was during the, the Trump administration and I was at lunch in DC getting ready to hit the museums. And um, the Trump's then EPA director, uh, Scott Pruitt was in the same restaurant that I was. And this was a guy who was you know, put in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency. But as you might imagine, it, you know, the president being Trump, he was put there really to dismantle it from the inside. He's a guy who had previously sued the EPA. I mean, it was it was really egregious. So he was in there just rolling back regulations left and right. Um, you know, who cares about air, water, whatever he wanted his friends to make to make some money. Uh, and he was misusing tax dollars pretty egregiously as well. Um, so anyway, he would never do press conferences. You could never get a meeting with him. There was no accountability there. And he here he was in the same restaurant that I was in. You know, and uh, so I thought I, I've got to, I guess I got to, I got to say something to him. <clears throat> so I went up, I had my little two year old with me at the time. And I, um, you know, listed off some of the ways in which he was misusing tax dollars and, and said what he was doing to the environment, um, you know, very nicely. And then concluded that uh, I thought he should resign. And um, 
I didn't think too much of it. We, my, my husband had you know, took the, took the video as one does these days and posted it online and it went very viral. Uh, and he resigned a couple of days later. Um, that meant that I suddenly had, you know, my the 15 minutes of fame. I was getting shuttled back and forth to, through to different major, you know, TV networks, doing interviews, getting asked to write op-eds and, and all of it, getting recognized on the streets, all these things. I suddenly had this platform this that I knew would be a temporary platform. Um, and I also knew that it wasn't like he had resigned because I told him to resign. All of the groundwork that had been done to, to showcase the ways in which he was corrupt um, and, and what had been done to kind of lead to the point where this one viral video was able, able to help push things over the edge. All of that work had been done by different, you know, nonprofit groups and, and organization, you know, environmental groups, all of these sorts of things. And so I really wanted to try to use that 15 minutes to lift them up and amplify them. And I thought, you know, I'm seeing my Twitter followers ticking up and I was like, what is the, what's the point of this? You know, I need them to be going to these other groups who had actually done the work and had the experience here to do something with that platform. So I was trying to, I was basically like, whatever these groups want me to do, I will do. So they were having me, you know, um, put out the word for different events that they had. Um, they were having me speak at different rallies, come, they were having me go to lobby meetings on the Hill with them, whatever they wanted me to do, I was doing. And so suddenly I found myself in this space where um, I was talking with and working with the folks who make the organizing decisions about strategy, about ways to move move policy and, and shift the way things are happening um, based on these you know, shared values about things that we, the public, want. Um, and so that was very different from just kind of following the instructions that I would get in the email about call your legislators and tell them that suddenly I was with the people who make the decisions about what those steps in those emails should be. Um, the people who will put together, you know, the, the press conference or the rally or the protest um, or the or the, you know, meeting with your Congress members. Um, and when I saw how much of a difference it could make to have, you know, the right people in those rooms coming up with those ideas and, and generating that energy and then going out and mobilizing the public in that way. Um, that was very exciting to me. Um, that, you know, a lot of people say and have heard, well, one person, one person can make a difference. But until I really saw those rooms, those Zoom rooms, really what they were at the time, <laughs> um, but, um, but seeing those conversations and the decisions that were, were being made, and then you would go forth and there would be suddenly, you know, it was, it was mobilizing people nationwide to do, you know, these different things and invest in these different issues. When I saw that, I was like, wow, you know, a handful of people in the room who are taking these things on one person really does make a difference. And so I started doing more, you know, helping and supporting that side of the work more. Um, and I ended up getting a job offer from one of those groups, which is called the Center for Popular Democracy, as you noted, um, and, and working for them full time. And I became their senior legislative organizer, uh, working in the DC area, uh, helping to mobilize national movements, as well as helping to support um, state and local policy and, you know, that, that was being mobilized by some of our smaller community partners across the country. And um, my full-time job became uh, uh, pushing our elected officials to try to get them to do the right thing and, and mobilizing the public to push our elected officials to get them to do the right thing. And so, you know, you spend enough time trying to get elected officials to do the right thing and you start to realize this would be a lot easier if we just had those seats. So lo and behold, here in Montgomery County, um, we had a moment where there were two districts added, two new districts, two empty seats. Um, term limits have recently been instituted and we had people who were turned out. So all of a sudden we had six out of 11 seats on the county council where there was an opportunity to, to seat a council not just one person, but we could seat a whole council of folks who are, you know, community minded and, and politically courageous and ready to, to fight for the people is, you know, an exciting moment. And, and one of those empty seats was in my district. So, you know, I, I decided to run and uh, and here we are. Wow. And here we are. What a, what a courageous and I would almost say fantastic journey <laughs> to becoming a council member. It's almost like someone scripted a movie. <laughs> and they they found um, a notion, you know, the most noble and admired figure um, in American culture, a mother whose passion for her family and her community gave birth to a, a full political career all the way through to becoming a elected official. 
it's 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 amazing. How how does that strike? Do you wake up sometime and find find that this is you know is something significant, or are you just in, are you in the moment? How do you how do you feel about your journey? Looking at it from where you are now, looking back at the mother that was expressing her outrage to a public official. I mean, it is it is when I step back and think about it, you're right. It is, it is kind of wild at the same time, you know, I was doing that organizing work for, you know, a number of years, um, informally and then formally, and it doesn't feel that different to be doing it from this seat. I'm still working with a lot of the same people. And then plus a lot more people, of course, um, in, who are in the community and who are working to drive policy change. I'm, I'm still working with those same people, um, locally, uh, who I was working with before, and then of course adding lots of other partners and, and constituents and, and so on. Um, but it's still uh, the process is still relatively similar. I'm still working with community groups to understand the needs. What are the most pressing issues, and what do people really need in order to um, uh, in, in order to get those needs taken care of? Um, and then figuring out. What's the strategy to get there? Um, now that I'm kind of in the room where it happens, I'm able to get more direct insights into who are the council members who need more help and nudging and what what might help per- persuade them to take an interest in a particular issue or to move on a particular issue. Um, so, but, but a lot of what I'm doing feels very similar to before, just with more access. Um, and so in that way, it doesn't feel like Wow, I've really, you know, ascended, or, or, you know, I'm doing. I, I feel like a lot of the phone calls I have are, are not so different. There's just there's more of them, and there's more people, uh, and that's all good. And I have more access. But um, broadly speaking, it doesn't it doesn't feel super different. Wow, and I feel like we've been we you've shared so much so far, and um, about what you're passionate about and some of the initiatives that you're working on. Are there any issues in particular that you want people to know about and and be aware of that um, they may be able to support or they may care about but not realize there's action being taken already? Yeah. So I'd love to tell you a little bit more about that piece of legislation I mentioned earlier, um, rent stabilization and, and tenants' rights bill. Uh, it's called the HOME Act. Um, you can read more about it if you go to Home Act MC for MontgomeryCounty.com, homeactmc.com. Um, there are actually a two, uh, we made the website because it's actually a little confusing because there are two pieces of legislation, two bills that have been brought on this exact same issue, a rent increase cap. And so it's a little confusing. So if you go to that website, it breaks it down and it also has links to both the text of both bills. Uh, and it has information about um, the many community groups and labor unions who are supporting the HOME Act. Um, but what it does is it caps rent increases for each year, as I, as I mentioned, at, at 3% or what's called the voluntary rent guidelines, whichever one, whichever one is lower. Uh, the voluntary rent guidelines are a measurement that have existed in Montgomery County since the early 80s. Um, they are based on inflation, our, our local measures of, of inflation as specific to housing. Um, and um, the issue is that, you know, they have been voluntary. And so many landlords don't don't follow them. Many do, but many don't. Um, and they have averaged uh, 3% over the last 20 years. So 3% is a totally reasonable cap. It's in line with long-standing local standards. Um, and um, and I'll note also that Prince George's County just passed a bill that caps rents, uh, rent increases at 3% as well. Um, that's a one-year bill, and then they're hoping to pass a permit piece before that gets lifted. Um, Mount Rainier also, um, uh, the city of Mount Rainier also just passed a rent cap that's similar. So this is it's a, it's a number that is very much in line with our regional partners as well. Um, and then additionally, we have built in uh, you know some extra tools to address some other issues that we've been hearing from folks on the ground. So one uh, is the need for affordable housing. We need more of it, and so there is a funding stream that is built into the bill that funds affordable housing that goes into a fund for uh, affordable housing construction. Um, and then two is that we have, unfortunately, we do have some landlords who um, are truly unaccountable, um, who are not making the repairs that they need to make, um, who are not even meeting our, our county's standards um, legally. Uh, and it's very hard to get them to do the right thing. So there is an acknowledgement that we do not have enough tools as a county to um, to, to move 
a number of these landlords, and that's a problem. So we've tried to build a tool into this bill as well. We still need more. Um, but uh, for this one, if you need, if you want to apply to increase rent over three percent. A, you can only do that uh, if you're at risk of um, cutting into your net operating income. So it, we do make sure that landlords are able to maintain their net operating income, which is also constitutionally required. We cannot be eating into that. Um, so they can they apply. They just you know submit their their income and their expenses, and then that's fine. However, in order to do that, they must be in good standing with the county. In term, from a code enforcement maintenance perspective, because what I'm hearing, what I heard during the campaign on doors and what I'm still hearing now every day as, as a council member, as I hear from folks, is that, you know, the same landlords who are not uh, not responding to requests to fix the plumbing, um, getting heat working, taking care of, um, you know, roaches and rodents and other infestations, they will still send over an increase of 8%, 10%. 13%. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. So uh, we have to put a check on that. So that bill is, is uh, I'm glad we're having this conversation right now because it's in play right now, the consideration of the two of that bill and the other rent stabilization bill. There's a public hearing coming up on March 28th. And it's super important that anyone who wants to be involved in this conversation um, sign up to testify, contact your council members, because there are, again, two bills on this. So um, the HOME Act uh, caps rent increases at 3%. Um, and uh, the other bill caps rent increases at 8% plus inflation. Right mm -hmm. now, that would come out to a rent cap of 15.5%. Whoa. Yes, that is already more than many landlords are, are doing. So it would just kind of give them a license to uh, to go ahead and do a higher cap. Oh, the, the county says that, the, that this is the most we can do. I might as well do that. Um, and then also, I hear every day from folks who are uh, who need are looking for new housing who can't afford their, an increase of you know six percent. So um, you know the idea that that a fifteen point five percent cap is going to help those families is. Uh, you know, very concerning. So one of these two bills or some, you know, compromise position there uh, is likely to be passed. And right now, neither of those bills has the votes that it needs to become law. County Executive Mark Elrich has said that he would veto that 8% plus inflation bill. He has said that that is a bill that licenses gouging as opposed to what it's called, which is a, an anti-price gouging bill. Um, that said, you know, it, it should be up to the public. So we need to know what you think. Um, please sign up to, to let us know. It's a conversation. It is great that um, even though there are two competing bills and I obviously have a particular perspective about which one I want to see passed, it is great to see so many council members engaging in the conversation um, that this wasn't possible even, you know, six years ago. It, it just wasn't it just wouldn't have happened. Um, so if you go to, um, again, Home Act MC. Dot com, there is a link to sign up to testify under the Take Action tab. And so I would encourage folks to, to come and have their voices heard. On March 28th, there is going to be both an afternoon and an evening session. You can come testify in person or virtually. Um, right now, it's going to tell you that you're being added to a wait list. That's okay. Please sign up for the wait list. Um, Council President Glass is looking at um, you know, how we can accommodate folks, you know, where we can add hours and, and things like that. So please just add, uh, sign up to the wait list. Oh, wow. That's, that's fantastic. And I, I know you've given it a couple of times already, but can you give that URL one more time? Yeah, it's Home Act MC for Montgomery County. So homeactmc.com. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Now, so you've shared a, a, a very important piece of legislation that um, you are passionate about and that is very timely and is um, geared to helping people. Um, another way you can help people as a public figure, as a, as a, a council member, a new council member, um, and a woman that's demonstrated uh, courage, um, what, how do you, what, what advice do you have for young men and women that want to some, someday be the next Krista Mink? Um, uh, oh, what, aim higher, folks. Aim higher. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just to aspire to public office or even yeah. to advocate. Uh, sometimes there's a feeling of helplessness that people feel and they don't know mm -hmm. that there's ways they can fight um, constructively sure. um, and as you have. Um, how do you, what type of advice do you have for those young people? 
Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for young people, men, women, non-binary folks, I will say we need more more visibility for non-binary mm-hmm. folks as well. So I'm, I'm going to make sure I include that sure. also. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that I have realized through th- through this process um, was that I th- when I was a kid, I think the idea that I would be in elected office, it never even crossed my mind. Um, and that's not surprising because when we look in our history books and we sit down for our social studies lessons, you know, by and large, the people that we're seeing there, they, they do not look like me, um, an Asian woman. Um, they are mostly white men, wealthy, um, who come from backgrounds that made them know and believe that that was a seat for them. That really has been what the history has been. And times are changing, and that's a good thing, and, and I'm um, honored to be a part of it. We Again, we have a, a county council now that is majority women, that is very diverse. Um, and um, so I one of the things also that that gave me the uh, the feeling that this was something that I that I could do or that I that I should do was that in my advocacy work with the Center for Popular Democracy that brought me into the room with many different uh, Congress members. Um, and one thing that I noticed was a lot of them they don't even read the bills. They don't know what's in the bill. Some of them not particularly smart. Don't particularly care about the issues. I'm just going to be frank. A, a lot of them that that's not the case. So plenty of them do read the bills, they do their research, um, and, and or they do care about the issues or, or, you know, whatever. But there are plenty of people who very clearly they just walked into that job because they have a lot of money and they have a lot of access. Um, and, and, and the people would be better served by any of the of the um, community members who were sitting in that meeting asking them to please do the right thing. So, um, th- so, you know, when you see that, then you're like, okay, well, there is no reason that any of those folks, I, I, I don't want them to just feel like, oh, this seat is for me and so I get to have it. We need folks who, um, who are impacted, who are in community, who are normal, regular people, who just who care about the issues that their family faces, that their neighbors and community face. Those are the folks who we need in office. So there are things that we need to do legislatively to make that more possible financially. And we have done some of those things in Montgomery County. Um, Public financing, for example, I could have never done this um, without public financing in place. Um, But we also just need folks to, to, you know, to, to shift their, their mindset, young folks who are, who are coming up and who this idea might never have occurred to you that a seat of power and an elected seat is, is a seat for you. If you don't think it's a seat for you, you are the person that we need in that seat. <laughs> All right. You are going to make a difference. You are a voice that is probably missing and it is critical to have you there. So, um, yeah, the more you think that, um, no, this is this is for somebody. This is for somebody else. It's not accessible to me. Um, the more I would like you to seriously consider running for office, because we could really use your voice at the table. Wow, and that, and that is quite ins- ins- inspirational there. Wow. All right. Now, it's it's also an opportunity here for you to um, offer some more inspiration, or at least um, recognition. It's of Women's History Month, and as a uh, woman of note. I believe. Um, what is it that you would like to share with people about the significance of Women's History Month in ways that they can celebrate Women's History Month here in Montgomery County, Maryland? Yeah, I mean, so a, a lot of what I what I just shared are some of the reflections I've been having around Women's History Month. Um, and, and I'll note also that, um, uh, you know, to, to expand on that, um, not just it's not just um, seats of elected office where I think many of us women especially uh, come into those spaces um, thinking this is not exactly f- you know for me and um, and you know maybe am I am I good enough am I smart enough do I do I know enough things do I have enough connections um, that's a sentiment that I think a lot of uh, that a lot of women and girls carry in uh, in a lot of different rooms and a lot of different spaces where where decisions are made, where important conversations are are being had, and so um, I, I think that uh, it's a good this month is a good moment to to um, to reflect on that and to take note of 
um, whenever you are in one of those spaces and you get that feeling of, you know, am I, am I enough? Does my voice belong here? Um, when I voice this, are people going to look sideways at me um, and, and say that that kind of bravery um, is important? Um, that it, uh, if, if you're questioning, again, whether your voice belongs here, um, that's a good sign that your voice is going to make a difference and a difference that matters. So um, look for those look for those opportunities to insert yourself in spaces that that feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, bring an ally with you when you can, um, you know, and, and it shouldn't always fall on, on the impacted community to, to take that to take that upon ourselves. Um, but when you feel when you feel up for it, um, when you when you feel safe enough to do so, um, absolutely take up that space. Um, insert your voice into the, in the conversation, uh, and know that by doing that, um, you are laying the groundwork for the next person to feel a little more comfortable to do the same. And, um, and that's how we continue to shift, to shift the Overton window and, sh and shift the balance of power. Wow. All right. All right. Um, now you mentioned uh, a few URLs earlier and you mentioned also that people, it's important for people to reach out to the elect elected officials. How would you like people to reach out to you, um, Council Member Meek? So, yeah, if my contact information is on that website, which is homeactmc.com. Um, you'll see my email address and phone number there, but I'll share, I'm going to share my email address also here, which is councilmember.mink, councilmember.mink, M I N K, at Montgomery County MD montgomerycountymd.gov. And I will just note also that you can you can uh, replace my last name, Mink, with any of the last names of any of the other council members <laughs> to reach them as well you right. know, about any issue, any issue that you care about. And I'll, and I'll note also that um, a lot of folks think that they're represented by one council member, the council member for their district. Everybody has five council members because there are four at-large seats, meaning there are four council members who were elected to represent the entire county um, and then within that, you know, there are seven districts and, and every district ha each has their own person. But everybody has those four council members who depend on your votes as well as their one district council member. So whenever you have any issues, I would encourage you to, to reach out to the whole council, first of all, if it's something that's really important to you about a particular vote or a piece of legislation, because we are all going to vote on all of those pieces. And there are particular people who sit on certain committees that that bill may pass through who might not be one of your five council members, and you want to make sure that they're hearing from you early and often also. So if it's about a piece of legislation or a particular broad issue that you want addressed, Email, email, put everybody on there, council member dot everybody. Um, but, uh, but if it's a particular um, issue that is particular to you, individual to you, or you have a particular question, you have five council members and, and feel free to reach out to all of them. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, so not only should you use your voice, there's now ways to use your voice um, constructively and proactively via the means that council member Mink has set forth. And... I would always encourage people listening to this podcast that may be watching it on Facebook or YouTube to use their voices and ask the question, what's happening, MoCo? Because you deserve the answers. Thank you so much to our special guest today, Council Member Mink. Um, thank you to her for her inspiring journey and for sharing words of wisdom for the next generation of leaders to come. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. 